I have known her for years, and since before she wrote her book, um, Untamed Hospitality, which is kind of where this um, theme for an Advent study came from in the first place, and I'm just delighted that she is here to share with us. Last week, she laid a foundation on what it, what kind of hospitality is God's kind of hospitality? What is it over and against how we see Southern living hospitality? And to kind of lay that foundation for us so that as we move into the, the nativity narrative, um, we can look at the different characters and even at God as ones practicing that, that kind of untamed hospitality. So tonight we're going to move look to looking at Mary and Beth. I'm so glad that you're here to share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And uh, it was really delightful. Anna and I had a couple of conversations, but one at Panera's that was very helpful, that we talked about hospitality and really trying to, uh, and thank you, Anna, you summed that up very nicely from last week. Um, but now turning today and in what follows, even until after after our Christmas with Epiphany, to looking at um, hospitality um, through the lens of the Christmas story. So uh, with that in mind, then, I want to start with Mary. And the Catholic Church has um, given Mary a lot of titles, you might know that. <laughs> but one of them that is that they have called her the patroness, the patroness of Christian unity. And um, that can be a little bit challenging, I think, for Protestants, because I don't know your own backgrounds, but I grew up, you know, Mary was a little bit, in the way the Catholics were ladies, were a little bit suspicious, right? <laughs> um, and um, I came, grew up in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and yeah, you know, we had friendly relationships with Catholics, but, you know, we sort of thought they worshipped Mary. <laughs> and, and if that's the case, then there's not going to be, you know, it's more divisive than unifying. Um, so, uh, I wanted to just pause, and your own, anybody want to speak to their own um, responses or reactions to Catholicism and Mary, just very briefly. Any, any? Oh, I was just, I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic school. Okay. Uh, Mary is held in the highest. Yes. Regard. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so that has been, um, I'm involved in these dialogues between Baptists and Catholics now. And we've gone through different things. So with Mary, we've, we've reached some agreement, but there's also very much caution as well, particularly um, from Catholics in um, Central and South America, Mexico, because Mary sometimes uh, overshadows Jesus uh, from certain perspectives, although that's not a, formally the teaching of the church. River Road takes a trip to Panama oh, on, yes, yeah. on occasion, and it's been a couple of years since they've gone, but outside of the schools where they do, do their medical care mm -hmm. min ministry, um, when you pull into the school, there are these cases that have inside of them some kind of a figurine of Mary, like mm -hmm. a, a closed-in case. At all the schools, there's some Mary figure there. Yeah. yeah. Um, there isn't a Jesus figure there, but there's a Mary figure <laughs> at all of their schools. Yeah. And I will, I will just, I have to do feel the need to, to clarify, I mean, the actual teaching of the Catholic Church is that um, you give um, you give honor to Mary or um, veneration, but that's not worship. That's different from worship. But then in the actual practice of it, sometimes it's like, mm, it's Lord. So. <laughs> okay, so so I wanted to begin with a quotation from a Baptist by the name of John Broadus, and you might have heard of that name in the Baptist world, Broadus Flats. And uh, anyway, okay, here it is. So John Broadus, he was the second uh, president of Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And he uh, preached a sermon called The Mother of Jesus. Uh, and so let me just read what he says here. While the Romanists, of course that would have been what they call the Catholics, have come very near making her an object of worship, Protestants standing back in horror from that terrible idolatry have seemed, to sh have seemed to shrink sensitively away from ever saying a word or ever thinking for a moment about the mother of Jesus. Broadus asked, but isn't it a pity that we should go to the opposite, opposite extreme as regards the mother of our Lord? And so it's really interesting here in the 19th century, 
I think as a Baptist, he's speaking in language that I would say we have even lost today. You know, the mother, you know, the mother of our Lord, the mother of Jesus, you know, sort of lifting that up. But what he is pointing to is how can we as Baptists recover um, a broader understanding of Mary than just sort of bringing her out at Christmas time and you know, putting her in the creche <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then forgetting about her the rest of the year. So part of then my presentation today is I want to respond to Broadus, but also with an eye to looking at Mary and hospitality. And so I want to do this by um, looking at Mary as a figure or as, a, as someone who embodies a providential pattern. And um, this is what we already see in Scripture. I'm going to just give you an example of this before I go to Mary. Where in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says that our ancestors were baptized into Moses and they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Now, that's weird because, yeah, Christ isn't technically in the Old Testament. But Paul is using um, providential patterns of how God works um, through saving through the water, like the Israelites were saved through the Red Sea. And then baptism also saves. So, okay, I see puzzled expressions here. <laughs> Hopefully this will make sense. <laughs> Feel free to, like, go, hey, this is, like, absolutely ridiculous. I um, so what I want us to look at is that Mary uh, magnifies the Lord, and she is a figure for magnifying God, but also for magnifying the church. Okay, so she magnifies the Lord, and she magnifies the church. And so tradition really has described Mary as a figure for the church. And I've got three images I'm going to talk about then to show how this sort of unfolds with Mary. Okay? So the first one is Mary as the daughter of Zion. Mary as the daughter of Zion. And when in Luke 2, um, Mary is described in Luke in a way that follows the pattern of Hannah who was unable to conceive a child, right? And so her prayer to God is, you know, if you give me, oh, don't do that yet. <laughs> Wait, back up, yeah, thank you, okay. <laughs> I don't wanna get you out there. Um, uh, so um, Mary becomes um, one who sort of follows in that pattern of women who um, are not able to have children on their own. And God makes that possible. And of course, with Mary, it's made possible in a miraculous way through the virgin birth. But even her, um, my soul magnifies the Lord, um, that is actually um, imitating in some ways the same words that were with Hannah. So daughter of Zion, Zion is Israel. And so when we call Mary the daughter of Zion, we are saying that she is Jewish and she is one who represents Israel. And... Um, as a Jew, she sort of fulfills Israel, uh, Israel and their obedience to God. This okay. So now, <laughs> you can this a bit, yeah, this like, okay. So this is an odd uh, image, and let me just um, describe it, and then I might get you a little bit of your feedback, and then I'll talk some more about it. But this is, of course, Moses and the burning bush, and here you have. Moses with the Ten Commandments, and there's the burning bush, and Mary is in the burning bush. Now, we might get a little bit nervous about this as Protestants, because it could look like, you know, God speaks through the burning bush. Well, what does this mean? Mary is speaking through the burning bush. Um, and this is what my husband thought, by the way, when I, said, <laughs> when I showed it to him. But I think the richer way to understand this, because Mary is looking up to heaven, so here you have Moses receiving God's word. And then Mary is the daughter of Zion, is the one who receives God's word most fully because she, um, she gives birth to the word, to Jesus. And so here Mary as the, um, as the daughter of Zion 
is one who is, in a sense, a kind of Moses figure, you know, receiving the word of God. Okay, so let me just pause right there. Does that make any, any comments or questions? What's the source of that <clears throat> artwork? Do you know? Thank you. And, you know, I could not find it when I was uh, redoing this, so... Um, uh, yeah, I didn't say that's not, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Is it, I mean, is it ancient? Is it, is it? The end, okay, modern? yeah, I think this is a more modern portrayal, uh -huh. but the, this, um, this image itself of Mary in, at, identified as the burning bush, or in the burning bush, is an ancient, is okay. an ancient image, yeah. It's in the Orthodox Church, actually, and they even have references to sort of describing Mary in the burning bush, so that idea, so the image is, is ancient. Um, yeah, so here you see, you know, this is holy ground. Moses' shoes are off. Okay, and here, of course, he has left um, the Hebrew people and gone up to Zion. So the daughter, you know, so this is why the image of the daughter of Zion sort of resonates with this depiction. What I put up here is hospitality versus idolatry. And as we know from the story, Moses receives the Ten Commandments and goes down to the Hebrew people, and what are they doing? They're worshiping the golden calf. And they're having a party, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought later I could have put here what kind of hospitality, because it's a, it's a pagan hospitality. That they are, the you know, hospitality is rooted in, uh, in festival. And... Um, but, it, but it's a false hospitality. And so the word of God to Moses illuminates the fact that they are worshiping idols. And those two go together. It's God's word that then enables them to see how their hospitality is idolatrous. So I wanted us to think again today about um, ways that idolatry might prevent us from practicing hospitality. And I know idolatry is sort of a, um, a word we don't much, you know, we don't really use today as much. Like, you know, you don't go around and say, idolatry, you know? <laughs> We think of it as antiquated. Um, but uh, if you, you know, the idea that we all worship something, we all give our lives to something. So what is it that we are giving our lives to that um, prevents us from practicing God's hospitality fully. And I've got a story here that I wanted to share um, along these lines. And this was a, um, okay, so there's two parts to this story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the first part because it's where they realized that this was a church that realized the kind of hospitality they were practicing wasn't being faithful to the word as they as embodied in their in their community in their context. Um, so it was, um, yeah, I mean it was idolatrous in the sense not that they were like you know put uh, Ishtar out there <laughs> on the street, but idolatrous in the sense that that the process of going through this enabled them to realize their own lack of faithfulness and they were trusting in the wrong thing. Okay, so this is, um, this is from Chicago First Church of the Brethren. And the, pa the, the uh, assistant pastor wrote this up in an article. So he says that their church, um, you know, they really wanted to do something for their community. And what they decided to do was to participate in a government-sponsored program that, um, where they allowed their facility, and they participated in it too, to function as a distribution site for surplus agricultural commodities. The government required the church to obtain a proof of poverty from every person who came through the door. Usually the card issued to those um, poor enough to participate in the Medicaid program. And then this is what um, 
Gilbert Bond, who's the assistant pastor, wrote about the situation upon reflection. The comic absurd part of the requirement became apparent when one reflected upon who else would wait in the Chicago winter outside a church for several hours to receive a five pound brick of processed cheese if they could afford to buy it or a better grade of cheese in a grocery store. Okay, that's in quote, unquote. So in this situation, uh, counting and quantifying the really poor became terribly dehumanizing. Then Bond writes, one young man who failed to prove he had failed angrily erupted. Who else in the blankety blank do you think all these people here uh, think, what else in the blankety blank do you think all these people come here for? Everybody lining up here is poor. If we weren't poor, we wouldn't be here. So there was some anger you know, going on um, in the way that this was being uh, carried forward. Okay, so I'm going to pause that and come later to what the church ended up doing. But I think here it's an example of hospitality um, in the mode of unfaithfulness. And I mean, sometimes you give them credit for doing this. I mean, I think it was going through the process sometimes to realize how God is actually calling them to be faithful. But in the process of doing this, they realized that the hospitality they wanted to offer as the body of Christ was very different than what the government was offering. Um, and, you know, so you could say, you know, if you were only sticking with what the state told you, you could have said they would have been making an idol of the state. Okay. By the way, my husband, uh, when I was telling him, sorry, he's remembered uh, his, uh, his aunt. He comes from Alabama, so poor roots. He remembers her uh, talking about getting similar kind of cheese. And he said, he goes, and it never really melted. You know, so it was, it was so processed. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so, you know, the quality of what you're offering is also important, I think. Um, so the question that I have um, to see if anyone wants to speak to are what the, there things. What are there, what might be obstacles or ways of being unfaithful that we can name um, in our practices of hospitality? Well, um, I was at Nicholsville and the food pantry, and that certainly was part of the process to see if they've been there more than once yeah. that month and yeah. all that. And then that tends to bring us have a judgmental, you know, right. when you're there, you're judgmental, you right. know, wow, they're trying to get in here again, yeah. you know, so it kind of drags, you know, I mean, we don't say that, but yeah. we th we're thinking it, and, we're, and it makes things less godlike, but, the, you know, I think all food pantry, you know, my sister worked in one in Florida, and they, they do the same, they right. make sure they only come once, blah, 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 right, yeah, or twice a month, I don't yeah. remember, but, so it does bring, you know, that whole, like, rules, and it brings out, sort of in a way, kind of the worst in those that are trying to do the work. Right, I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. And I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's, uh, I, I mean, I guess in my own mind, I would distinguish between um, what we today call charity, uh, although that's, you know, become a devalued word. I mean, charity used to be caritas, you know, and, and genuine love, but today, you know, giving charity is something that's different than hospitality because hospitality, and this is what I, wanted, I emphasized last week as well, when it's grounded in who we are as beings created for communion with God and others, it's always a fluid thing. I mean, if you're only, it, I mean, surely there's a place to do stuff for people. But genuine hospitality allows some opening where you are also able to receive from the other person. So that, that reminds me of a, a couple of examples. Um, so a number of years ago, um, I was at, um, was the Daily Planet? I don't know if that still exists. Yeah, I remember that. I was there. Yeah. Um, and we were providing food, a meal for people. And there were tables that all the food was on. And we were behind the tables. And they were, the, the guests were in front of the tables. And it was really hard 
to come out from behind the table. Right. Because the table was like your protection. Yeah. And the lack of um, recipro reciprocity is mm -hmm. the word mm -hmm. yeah. that you talked about last yeah. week. Yes. Because as long as we were behind the table, yeah. we were the givers giving out charity. Right. But when we came out around the table and joined them, then it became hospitality. Right. Yeah. And it was a lot easier to do charity than it was to do hospitality. Yes. Right? Yeah. And we yeah. had to say, okay, guys. We, we're done serving now. Why are we still back here? Yeah, yeah. Let's get out yeah. and become, let, and make friends here. And yeah. that's a difference, I think. It is. It it's, happened in Caritas and when we yeah. were in Out Road. The same yeah. thing. It was really easy to stay behind the table, but the really folks who were doing it right were the ones out there. Yeah. Yeah. Having being hospital and, and receiving right. yeah. from them as well. No, I think um, there's something about, well, I guess there's all sorts of reasons psychologically we could, we could say of, um, you know, it's more of a risk to go out. Um, it's much more comfortable to not, you know, <laughs> to, to interact with people sometimes. So, uh, well, we've just, just done an activity where we've essentially said we don't trust you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you're 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 putting those people down and acting like you're somehow different from them. Right. And the reality is, is right. you're the exact same. Yes, right. One little success story. Um, a couple of years, a number of years back, uh, our class was doing the Caritas Saturday night. We always took Saturday night. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the first night that the group would be here. And um, Linda Cash was supposed to bring the ice cream. She brought about five or six different quarts of ice cream with different flavors. And they went, oh, I get to choose. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> and you think about it, they just, they just get whatever yeah. people dish yeah. So. Ever since then, Aww. we've made sure that they get to choose. Yeah. And now that we're going down to the group home down on here, uh, we tried to do the same thing with the salad. Uh, we tried to set up a salad bar. Oh. The administration did not want that. Really? They, did, they didn't want people going by and, and even us. The first time we got it, they let us do it. We had we had all the different things that might be in a, in a green salad. The next time they before we turned around, they just dumped everything in the bowl and, and, and shuffled it all up so everybody got it. Yeah. But yeah, that's you know, try, and that's what struck me in at Land when we did the uh, work uh, with the food pantry there this past uh, year, that I was amazed they, they, they get a box or two or three boxes, depending on, on what, but I mean, it's a, it's a big, heavy box. It's 40 or 50 pounds of food. They have no choice. It's whatever the, uh, the volunteers mm. put into the box. Right. Yeah. So you, you drive up in a almost assembly line like like thing and you and you show your ID and they check it and see how much stuff you're able to get and you pop the trunk and we put it in. Mm -hmm. And but it's whatever whatever the yeah. uh, there's there's no choice. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a wonderful and I think um yeah, I think of the word agency of allow I mean when you honor someone you're giving them a sense mm -hmm. of agency. On the other hand, I, I don't think that operation could work if people were just allowed to come in and, exactly. and shop. Yeah. But, but don't we haven't we done the same thing with with some of the Christmas stuff with the with the at the uh, the, the Churchill Center where the parents there, get right? to come in and they're they're given vouchers or something they can pick up so many different things for their kids. So I guess what I'm saying is that when we do it, when we, the church does it, mm -hmm. we, we have the flexibility or the freedom to do some things. Mm -hmm. But when we partner with the government, yeah. that's a whole different thing. Right. Yeah. No, and I think that's exactly, and I'm gonna read the rest of this story in a minute, but that's exactly the kind of reflection that I think we need to ask ourselves in what ways are we compromising what is really God's hospitality for, other, for others. Okay, so we've got the daughter of Zion. The, the second image I want us to look at, these sort of flow together, is um, Mary as the second E. And, okay, I do have now the names. <laughs> kind of calls art print. Um, so, the figure or the pattern here is, of course, Eve. Uh, so, the first Eve was she obedient to God. No. <laughs> Along with Adam. Okay, we're throwing Adam there too. Yeah, no, she wasn't. And so when this when this imagery again, these are what are I like call providential patterns, you know, it's like it's like there's a there's um a recapitulation, I think is the technical term. This is also applied to Christ. So Christ goes and does repeats what was not happening 
in the history between God and Israel. And the same thing as Mary now. Mary is one who is, gets the title Second Eve because she receives God's word and is faithful. And then that um, faithfulness of reception of God's word is associated with new life in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is who enables her to be faithful. Hovers over her. And then the same spirit that hovered over Mary um, in the incarnation uh, hovers over me, hovers over all the disciples at Pentecost. And so you get these rich themes of the second eve, of new life, of new creation, of the spirit is what makes our hospitality possible. It's not just uh, human effort by any means. And the openness to the spirit is what enables us ultimately to be faithful to what we're called to be as God's hospitable people. So let me, um, oh, and I, I would like this, uh, along with the second Eve, let me just, new space opens up in creation for God to be born a creature. So Mary is, um, you know, both passive and active. There's a lot of criticism, criticism sometimes about Mary. She's just this sort of passive figure um, that's put up on a pedestal. But I think really the richness of the story is, yes, she's, she's, she's receptive, but she's receptive in a way that's, that's very active. You know, she, she's also an agent. She could have, you know, she could have technically, she could have said no, um, but she had already said yes to God because she was a faithful Jewish girl. So that yes flowed pretty naturally in her life. But this word, uh, she contains the uncontainable. So uh, very powerful phrasing there that when the word comes to Mary, she contains what is this profound and deep mystery that uh, we can never fully know the depths of. So I think y'all have already started talking, I mean, your stories were already uh, moving in the directions of, of how hospitality is life-giving. And... Uh, like when you were talking about allowing people, you know, something very simple, it can be very simple, you know, to choose that, that brings about a kind of life because it's, um, it's opening up so that they are in communion with you and you're not just sort of doling things out to them. Okay, so this is what happened then with the Church of the Brethren in Chicago. And, you know, the Brethren are, are similar in some ways to the Baptists. So we share some of the same, uh, some parallel history in terms of the way we think about the Lord's Supper and baptism, for example. The church, after much painful discernment and honest conversation, <coughs> okay, so I think that's really important, um, you know, this, the practices of discerning and the practices of conversation that go into helping us practice hospitality well. They came to realize that this program, based on calculating who was really poor, was inherently violent, and that some institutional structures are incapable of mediating God's peaceable kingdom. So the pastor, Bond, goes on to tell how the church developed an alternative ministry of neighborhood fellowship meals that involved eating, singing, and praying together. The brethren practice that formed the basis of this alternative ministry was the Anabaptist love feast, which includes a foot washing ritual and, and an agape meal. So, I know, are y'all familiar with the love feast? It's the Moravians also do that. Right. That's um, yeah. So it's, it's a tradition down at Wake Forest, uh, which is where I went. But um, and there are a lot of Moravians down there. But the, the love feast is. Um, um, it's a kind of, um, it's not quite the Lord's Supper, but it's a, it's a feast of eating together and being bound together through the love of God and the Spirit. And at least in the Moravians in Winston-Salem, you get a little hot sort of winter drink, I can't remember what it was, and this sort of sweet bun that's passed out. And then foot washing, again, um, wow, what a profound, uh, we might come to that later, but what a profound uh, practice of hospitality. You know, that Jesus did to the disciples. Um, so, but then he goes on to say about the shift, fewer people were served 
but neighborhood children eventually started coming to the church. Um, so really, I think a kind of openness there that um, they gave up, um, and I, in, this, in this particular section of my book, I talk about McDonaldized hospitality versus Christian hospitality. And McDonaldized just sort of stands in for, you know, you got to do it efficiently. You got to be in control. It's got to be predictable. And I'm trying to say Christian hospitality is none of that really when it comes right down to it. There's another story that um, I'll just mention because it came to my mind when y'all were talking, but also here about fewer people being served. And Dorothy Day, I don't know if you know her name at all, but she was a Catholic um, leader and uh, figure in the 20th century who started this thing called Homes of Hospitality or Houses of Hospitality. And really an amazing woman. But there's a story that um, that is written about where someone has given the Houses of Hospitality a diamond ring. And Dorothy Day puts it in her pocket. And later that day, she's eating across the table um, from this woman who's very, very, you know, very poor, but has been coming there faithfully, doesn't have much, and she takes it out of her pocket and gives it to the, to the woman. And the volunteers and those who were helping saw her do this, and they were like, well, we could have, you know, we could have used that money and done this, this, and this. And her response was, the poor have their dignity too. Um, so, so anyway, <laughs> but that, I mean, I think that's just, again, a powerful illustration of, um, you know, you might not be reaching everybody, but you're reaching this one person in this very profound way. And then that becomes kind of an image of what Christian hospitality is like. Okay, so the question I had for you to think about in this regard with Mary as the second Eve is um, in hospitality and life-giving is can you think of a personal experience of receiving hospitality that was very life-giving? A personal experience of receiving hospitality that was very life-giving. sick or you've had an, I mean when you if something has occurred health wise for yes you, yeah and you have friends and neighbors and, and church people send cards right. or calls yeah. not necessarily food right. and express concern I would consider that a personal hospitality yes. correct yes absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah. in fact I, I have a book uh, illustration I think I referred to it last week when I was hospitalized and uh, my husband, who's a United Methodist pastor, this was years ago, had to cancel the first the Good Friday service. And my parents were flying in. I mean, it was just a, a lot going on. But um, I just was overcome mm -hmm. by the reception that I got mm -hmm. from the church. I mean, it was just mind-blowing to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think when you're in that position where you can't, <laughs> you can't do anything, almost, you know, that, that comes out, yeah. I remember um, we, Bill and I had just chaperoned a youth trip to Asheville, mm -hmm. and I guess the youth were, um, I guess, number one, they made cards or whatever, but then they traveled together. I don't know if y'all remember that, but they were traveling, um, I mean, you know, like in a, together, and they were dropping the notes or whatever to people, and we got one, you know, so that was like <laughs> so amazing that they wrote a thank you note. And, I think it was around Halloween, and it was like a homemade Halloween card. And I mean, I was like, this is amazing. So, <laughs> so it was someone, this person on the road that... Oh, it was that, the youth. Oh, it was the youth. youth. Okay. They came in like a caravan and dropped it off. Ah, and I see. Bill and I were like, Oh, oh nice. Okay. I mean, that's that was like yeah. so amazing. Yeah, yeah. Very good. So, you never know. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I think this is hospitality years ago. We went to a Southern Baptist convention, and just before we left, my eye had started hurting. And when we got there, 
it just started hurting more and more and more until I was just in agony. Mm -hmm. So I went to this bank of pay, pay phones, that tells you how long ago, <laughs> in the convention center. And I'm trying with one eye to look through a phone book to oh. find an eye doctor that I could call. And this dear man overheard, somehow figured out what I was doing and said, oh, we have an eye doctor in our church. Let me call him for you. And oh, he called wow. him oh. and got me an appointment and yeah. put me in the cab and okay. sent me to this eye, yeah. eye doctor. And I have never gotten yeah. that. I mean, it was it was life. Absolutely. I wouldn't have been able to stand it if yeah. I hadn't been able to find it. I was just a young, you know, we were just young kids. We didn't yeah. know what we were doing. And, right. you know, I was in my 20s. And yeah. It was just so kind of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, and hospital, well, you said, I think this counts as hospitality. Yeah, I think definitely so, because really, and um, last week, just to remind what uh, folks of what I said, and then someone who weren't there, hospice, which of course we now use to refer, refer to those who are uh, sick and dying, the, the Latin hospice ref means guest, host, stranger. So we might be in any one of those roles, and we should be, um, if we're, you know, if we're being faithful, um, so that, and those should be fluid, but, you know, hospitality is giving and receiving as guests and hosts, or then in instances where we are receiving it from strangers. Um, and of course the, the Old Testament command to Israel, to go back to the daughter of Zion, is that you are to welcome strangers and aliens. Because you were once a stranger, name. <laughs> yeah, that's what's the that's the bottom line there in the Old Testament. Okay, well, thank y'all. Those were very uh, very powerful examples of ways that hospitality is is life giving, and I think also just the profound mystery of how the Spirit works in our lives. Um, you know, like the providential aspect of how that happens, where people are there that God works through to to come and to help us or heal us or other things okay so the last one okay so here this is probably familiar okay so here we have the image of mary as mother and then i've also put up here mary as child so we'll talk about the second one in a minute but mary as mother theotokos is the Greek word that means God bearer, or it's also translated mother of God. And so, um, again, I mean, you can think here of patterns um, and the ways that God has worked through other women in the Bible to, as prophets, as ones who point to God, um, you know, Esther, um, Sarah, all the, you know, others. And here Mary sort of is the one that sort of culminates those patterns together in a sense or brings them to a head. Now, um, they attack us. Okay, so mother of God. Now, I think that's not a word that falls off the lips of most Baptists. <laughs> and um, I always think of this, uh, when I was in teaching at St. Mary's College in South Bend, Lou Holtz was the coach of the football team there. And he was asked once whether or not God cared who won the football game. Mm -hmm. And his response was, God doesn't, but his mother does. Uh -huh. <laughs> so so that, you know, that's the Catholic, you know, the mother of God seems to here. But, okay, but I think it's important. Theotokos actually comes, um, is a word used back in the 4th century at the um, Council of Chalcedon. And it's a word that, it's a designation of Mary affirming who Jesus is. So Theotokos is about Jesus. It's ultimately a Christological term because the debate was whether or not Jesus was fully God, fully divine. And could we say that Mary is the, is the mother of God in that sense? So at, um, at the council said, yes, we can, because Jesus is fully divine. Okay, so all that to say that that term is not alien to Baptists. In fact, the Baptist Royal Alliance has on its website um, the use of that language in some of its documentation. This is, yes, we can affirm. Mary is the mother of God in that sense. Um, 
so the, the, the key thing here is that her hospitality, if we're looking at Mary as an image or a pattern for how we think about hospitality, it's uh, grounded in, of course, the centrality of Christ and the affirmation that Christ is fully divine and fully human. These icons, of course, um, this one's the Vladimir, so this is Russian, belongs to a family of images of the Theotokos known as the Virgin of Tenderness. And um, again, I mean, I think across the church, we might interpret Theotokos or we might practice it a little bit differently, but it is a common heritage um, for all Christians. I just like the tenderness there. Um, but I also, I want to also think about Mary as a child because there's a well-known passage in, I think it's in Luke's gospel, um, or maybe it's Matthew, where uh, the disciples come to Jesus and say, you know, your mother's outside and your brother's. And Jesus says, who are my mother? Who is my brother? You know, it's like a dismissal. Um, but, and then he says, yeah, any, whoever follows me and obeys my word yeah, is, is my family. And so I think then that um, Mary as a child, she is one who follows the word of God. So she is a child also um, in that sense as well. Um, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So lots of imagery in the Bible of being a child. And um, Mary reflecting that, what that means. What does it mean to be a child? What's the difference, by the way, between being childish and being childlike? <laughs> we might want to give a stat of that. The difference between being childish. So I'm actually I'm working in this program in the inner city of DC. I mean of Richmond now, and um, you know some of the kids are mm. <laughs> they're childish. You know, like don't don't go into my bag, okay? It's not your purpose. <laughs> so you know it's 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 not, but being childlike, like that's what we're we're called to be. That you know we're called to be um, children in a sense. Yeah, I think, sorry. I think childish, I think more behaviors. Mm, right? Yes. Um, when I think childlike, I think about, you know, that joy. Right, and the innocence. And mm, okay. It's like, I, I made reference to like our preschool director, Danielle, was all excited last week about the doors and the celebration and the competition and her energy was... Yeah childlike yeah and I, because of that mindset and I, I i understand what i'm trying to say but i don't know that i'm expressing it correctly. right yeah but I, I i'm an early childhood educator myself oh, and, are you? and so therefore i was relating to her joyousness right because it's childlike yeah. and children are joyous right. and it comes so naturally uh -huh. and i think the more we mature to me, we become a little more cautious mm -hmm. about that joyousness when we're around adults. Do you? Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is sad mm -hmm. because if you work with children, you see that joy all the time. Exactly. Yeah. And that yeah. innocence yeah. and that just spontaneity of right. life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And joy is such a wonderful word now in our season, right? Joy to the world. Exactly. So, um, yeah, certainly as adults, we are called to be joyous. Correct. Um, and the, ch uh, yeah, childlike, um, like what enables us to be joyous? I mean, I think that's, that's looking more uh, fully. And for children, um, you know, they are dependent in a sense on others to... Um, to assist them, to help them. And I think there's a connection here also with what Jesus is saying, calling us to be dependent on, on him. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, that, and, and, and with that comes, comes deep and profound joy. Uh, so now what, what does it mean to be dependent on Jesus? 
Um, we might have to think about that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, how, how would you sort of maybe spell that out a little bit? If, what does it mean to be dependent on Jesus? To live more in the present, not always fret, don't fret. You know, you don't have to yeah. fret if you depend on Jesus. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. yeah. Today's a beautiful day. Yeah. I know you make the most of the day. Yeah. But some people I know, which I'm one of <laughs> the biggest ones. Right. right. Yeah. You know, oh, and that it, you know, if you're dependent on Jesus, yeah. you don't do that. Yeah. Right. There you go. And I like the word presence because, um, of course, Mary lived in the presence of Jesus and remained in the presence of Jesus throughout a lot of his life. But I think for us here, we could say the analogy of living in the presence of God so that we're not preoccupied with the future. I mean, it's a, a tall order because I'm in the same way. I'm like always oh, thinking, yeah, always oh, over here. But um, yeah, but to live, and that that is a source of great joy. Um, the other the other thing in terms of children is also again going back to uh, I think the language of daughter. Um, what Jesus is by nature, which is the Son of God, we are by adoption. So we are adopted into the familial relation that the Son has with the Father. So we are in all sorts of scriptures. We are God's adopted sons and daughters and are already in that it was this we're already in that really we're already god's children <laughs> it's just it's just living into that and um part of it what that means really is to understand that we are created you know for communion with god and with others and so the practice of hospitality naturally is a part of that Okay, um, the last thing here, oh, yeah, let me just, let me go ahead and read. Uh, I've lifted up the word also, um, dependence, I like joy, presence, humility, because that's another thing that really Mary is the mother of God, but to think of Mary uh, as a child, she is one who embodies humility. And, um, the passage from my book that I was going to read, I'll probably come back to this again later, but <clears throat> one of the communities I visited when I was working on the book it was called Larsh. I don't know if you're familiar with Larsh communities, but their, their communities were people with handicaps, mental and also physical handicaps, live with those who do not have those handicaps. And so it's this whole effort to live together and um, to work together, to be present with each other, to eat together. This is uh, one author reflecting on these, um, on this experience of, of this. And this sort of maybe culminates, brings together a couple of the things we're talking about. Um, people who have been a part of these communities realize that the most important thing is not doing for, but being with. Doing for is characteristic of those who want to do something for the disabled, the professional or the teacher, and those might be necessary in some ways, but, but then this, whereas being with refers to the notion of wanting to share your life with somebody. It is the distinction between professional intervention and personal presence. From this perspective, the greater challenge is learning how to receive than in rushing to give. Um, the emphasis falls upon our receiving from the other the stranger, and behind this lies learning to see the other as a gift. And behind this lies a willingness to give up concern with efficiency and results and to waste time. I'll probably come back to that, that later, but um, this whole idea of what, yeah, because we don't want to, yeah, we don't want to waste time. Right, and hospitality can often cause us to, to waste time in some ways. But I think that emphasis here on being with is so crucial because to go back to Mary, she was one who um, consented to be with child and um, to have that humility and that dependence on God and and being with 
then she was able to extend God's grace and love to the world. Okay, well, let me, I'm going to stop there. Any, uh, any questions or comments that anyone would like to make? I liked your comment talking about Mary, that her face, I mean, you just can really get into that face and, and the way she yeah. is loving this child and the journey she followed prior to having this child. Mm -hmm. And then you made reference to what it must have been like to mother Jesus mm -hmm. and to grow with as she, as she was watching him evolve. I, you know, parenting children, I have often said to my daughters, you are so busy with life and parenting children, you just are doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. TikTok. Right. But then you become a grandmother and and the nurturing, not the parenting, mm -hmm. of the grandchild mm -hmm. because you have more time to appreciate how they're growing mm -hmm. and you get so involved in each one and as they grow, I kind of have like a parallel to what it must have been like for Mary yeah. in that world of just in awe right. of how he was evolving. Right. Yes. And right. Am I making any sense at all? Yes. Yes. No. I think um, I, I certainly see the compact. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, was just, I certainly relate to you know, parenting can be so hectic because you're just going from one thing to another, um, and yeah, and you, and you do you appreciate everything that they're doing, but you're also so mentally busy. I don't know. Yeah. And but now that I'm the grandmother, I kind of am forgetting that path and thinking that I did live it, I did do it. How did I do it? <laughs> right. Well, I think because that's it's half asleep. It's, that's it's, it's, calmer, <laughs> but it's calmer as a grandmother because right. my mind isn't as full. Yes. Uh, yeah. And well, I think one thing we, I know Mark and I talked about with COVID, I mean, as, challenge, as many, many challenges as it brought um, for all of us and, and even for our family, but it was like that pause of just being yes. with them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was you special. Know, yes. Mm -hmm. Despite what was causing it to right. be that way, it was like there was a real appreciation. But you were that. allowed to do what I'm basically saying as a grandmother, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. if COVID had not come, mm -hmm. so you could experience that feeling where your life slowed. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Yeah. And you could appreciate the individuality of each boy that you have yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i have and, a handle okay and i was just gonna Thank say you. i think that goes back again just to connect it to mary is having space in our lives mm -hmm. for god to come to us yep i mean that's whether it's other people or and yeah and it's a challenge with all at all level, at all ages maybe maybe when you're young parents especially <laughs> so there's nothing in scripture about this but don't you bet Jesus was a handful? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the yeah, particularly when he wandered <laughs> off and didn't even tell his parents. The temple and then they're like, yeah, okay. it, you were doing well. I bet you that was the tip of the iceberg. Uh, <laughs> that's funny you should say that, Scott, because I, I think I cannot picture Jesus having time now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, but that's, the, but that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the little picture on the Sunday school wall. <laughs> this is helping Joseph in my shop. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have you read Freeing Jesus, Diana Butler Bassett's book? No. While I'm reading it with my son's class, and I, I don't like Kindles for that purpose, but I just read while I was waiting the most lovely um, analogy that, and I can't even remember, but it was about how in childbirth, like when a baby is born, that I can't remember, but it's about the seeing God and then it's like experience seeing God in that birth. And I don't know, it was the most beautiful description and it just made me think about uh, yeah. how what it must have been like to be Mary who literally did give birth to God. Right, yes. And it's yeah. a lovely description if you yeah. get it. And I'm never going to buy another book like that on Kindle. Okay. <laughs> I can't find anything. But it's in there somewhere. Well, if you yeah. find it, let yeah. me know. I would, really I would love to have that. Yes, yeah. it's very lovely. Because the whole it's image beautiful. of birth, I mean, we yes. haven't looked at that as much. Yeah, so that's another whole. Because yeah. 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 Mary is a figure of the church 
And then the church, the church is to give birth also to, to, you know, to future generations. I don't guess that John Lee brought us sermons on mine anywhere, is it? The text? I, um, I, you I can't could, imagine. You could look it up, yeah. Um, but I don't know if it is or not, yeah. So, yeah, and amazing. I mean, that he even preached on the mother of Jesus. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, well, listen, let's uh, close with a prayer then. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this gathering and for being with us this evening. We thank you especially for your wonderful servant, Mary, and for the light that she sheds both in magnifying who you are and in magnifying who we as your people are called to be. I pray that you will be with us each this evening as we go our separate ways. May we rest in peace and rise ready to serve you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.